Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Abu Dhabi. Producer Jared is on the stairs. Cody Saftik is on the line. This kind of shows you, Cody, if you got the monies, the UFC will start a card in your local time zone. British people don't have the monies. Abu Dhabi, they've got the money, quite clearly. Yeah, well, I, I'm happy to get the early start time for sure, but I don't know. The UFC kind of does what the UFC wants. Last week was an abysmal outing. Crushed my spirit. Bilal Muhammad won. Fight went the distance over four and a half, uh, but but didn't even come close to saving my night. So just brutal. And then you come back to another foreign card in a different time zone with a bunch of 50-50 fights. It's like my confidence is shook, Paul Shaughnessy. My confidence is shook. But what can I do about it? Not much. So we'll break this one down, do it the best that we can, and hopefully get back on track and find some winners. Yeah, I feel like in, I'm not calling him Patty Pimblet anymore. I'm calling him Daddy Pimblet because uh, that guy just cost me money every single time. And credit where credit's due. Oh. His striking looked really good there. Bobby, I don't know what he's thinking, but, you know, Bobby's going to do crazy things, kind of <laughs> dumb things, shooting for takedowns on Patty. I mean, the whole – it was just it was just terrible game planning. It was almost kind of like a – well, I subbed Tony Ferguson. I'm going to, you know, he let his uh, his ego basically probably get in the way, I would imagine, if you asked him after the fact. But, uh, yeah, credit where credit's due. Patty Pimblett's uh, coming along nicely, and now he's in the top 15. So, uh, he's, you know, we've talked about him being kind of coddled and stuff like that. Well, now he's kind of earned his spot into it. Winning over Bobby Green is like, I mean, it's not you're the next champion of the world, but. You're in the it's a solid win, man. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very, win. very good solid win. Credit His partner in crime, Molly McCann, meanwhile, goes out and pitches a performance, the worst performance I've ever seen in her career. So, yeah, it was rough. Uh, the things I expected to happen did not. The things I did not expect to happen did. Patty Pimblet winning, the, I was 50 50 on that one. Yeah, well, we can't just get we can't get too focused on last week. You know, we lost money. It was uh, it was a rough one all the way around, but there's 13 fights for us to break down, Cody. And- Pitter patter, let's get at her. We got Umar Numagomedov taking on Corey Sandhagen, minus 280 for cousin Umar, plus 240 for Sandhagen. Cousin Umar, finally, this is his shot. This is his shot at to the uh, to the top of the mountain. I mean, if he wins this fight, got to imagine that uh, that O'Malley's next in line. Is the number a little bit jarring against a proven contender and? And Corey Sandhagen, yes. But I've been saying for a long time that this is the best bantamweight in the world. So um, the striking's obviously uh, is really, really coming along. He's got power, um, technique. Like in terms of you were going to compare him to like Habib, the wrestling is not nearly as as dominant as domineering and 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 so on and so forth. But his striking skills are leaps and bounds better than Habib was, particularly early in his career like this. Um, I know Sandhagen's been working on that wrestling. We've seen him utilize it offensively in some of his fights. Uh, Rob Font, for instance, you know, taking him down, controlling him, doing all of that. But there's levels, Cody. Cousin Umar's coming. Uh, let him know. But uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. And I know that P- Sandhagen's going to be a popular underdog pick with people this week. But... I think Umar's uh, about to uh, c- come knocking. Tell tell Sugar Sean he's coming. Yeah, Paul, you know, the picks that end up being losers for us are these guys that stand and bang or throw their game plan out the window or fight with questionable ring IQ. But the picks that win are the Blah Muhammad's of the world who training with Habib Nurmagomedov knows the go-to game plan. Strike a little bit, but get to that wrestling, do it often and well. So if anybody's going to get us back in the win column here, it's an OV Russian that knows how to wrestle. Yeah, 28 years old. It feels like Umar is that that next wave of Russian talent. And although his wrestling is probably not as good as Khabib's, like you mentioned, you're comparing a guy that's 28 years old, still in that early portion of his career, to potentially the greatest of all time. So I think Umar is definitely coming in the right, right direction. There's going to be a couple fights that are going to be like, oh, that's not his finest performance. His last time out against Bexat. Um, Alkmazan, I, he looked good, but not great. He got dropped in that fight. But again, you see when he does get the takedowns, I mean, he's got solid top game, solid top pressure, ends up just taking time away from the clock, decent with his ground and pound, doesn't take a whole lot of risks, but is pos- positionally sound. Can he do it for five rounds? Yeah, I'm thinking he's a five-round guy that's going to be able to just keep on going, build with momentum. 
hopefully lock it down. Corey Sanhagen, he's a fine talent, right? Guy can He can really do it all. He starts off as a striker. He's long. He's rangy. Bang Muay Thai guy. Excellent footwork. Excellent combinations. Pace for days. Another guy that has solid cardio. But very much his takedown defense and maybe his submission defense has been his kryptonite. So like any great fighter, he wants to shore up those holes, get better in those areas. And very largely he has. But now you're seeing he is kind of relying on it himself. Three takedowns against Marlon Vera to, to neutralize him for seven minutes of that fight. Seven takedowns against Rob Font in Nashville. And then not a very good fight. He lands 34 significant strikes in 25 minutes. Tears his tricep. Been off since because of the torn tricep. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, like you mentioned, he's gotten better in his grappling. Yeah, he's able to ground a guy like Rob Font. But there's levels to this. He's 32 years old, which is not old. But at Bantamweight, it ain't young. And he's coming off a layoff due to a, a torn tricep. The striking advantage, it's for Corey Sanhagen. I just don't feel like um, Umar Nurmagomedov is stupid enough to be standing with him for long periods of time. Similar to Bilal, pressure this guy, exchange in the pocket a little bit, but eventually drop levels, change uh, change it up, get the takedown, and then you got to secure rounds that way. In Abu Dhabi, I mean, I think that they're going to be down with his style. They're going to understand what's going on, and they're going to appreciate the grappling. And so do exactly that. Do what to Corey Sanhagen, what he literally just did to Rob Font. Take him down, ground him, neutralize him. I think it's possible. you got one guy that's... They're, they're both still on their way up. Corey Sanhagen be challenging for a title, but you've seen him against the elite grapplers, and he sort of struggles. Umar, meanwhile, this is a kid that's going to continue to get better, and I'm going to ride it. I don't love the line. It's wide. So as you mentioned, people will probably be coming in with plus money on Corey Sanhagen, making him a popular underdog this week. I get it. I understand it. But I, I got to go with the OV greatness here in the Russian fire to hopefully just land those takedowns, get the control time, and eventually get the unanimous decision victory. Yeah, five, round, five rounds, I guess, will be interesting. But he's shown us no signs of, like, slowing down as the fight goes on, right? Like... He's Russian getting those EPO. he's getting those takedowns. He's I mean, I imagine like training with his brother Uzman probably pretty regularly. Um he'll be ready for this performance. He he's he's their he's their next next big hope here. Um if he doesn't, it's gonna be sad, sad times for me. <laughs> All right, we got uh Shara Megamedov taking on Mihal Oleksheshek. Megamedov, a minus 220 favorite. Oleg Shashek can be had for plus 185. I mean, both of these guys, I mean, Shara, I've been looking at him going like, I just need to get him up against somebody who's just going to, you know, spam takedowns and, and make an ugly fight. And they've been doing a pretty good job of, uh, of matchmaking this guy. Obviously, they can only really... He can't get commissioned over here, from what I gather, because he's only got one yeah, eye. Yeah, he could. Sure, he could. Just not in every state. Okay, well, fair enough. Uh, yeah, they could probably bring him down to Florida or something. But, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's seven or eight states that it would allow a guy with one eye to compete. But again, he's not fighting in Vegas. He's not fighting in New York. He's not fighting in, you know, what would be considered the upper scale athletic commissions in the U.S. The liberal states is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't been that impressed with him. The cardio hasn't been all that impressive. Um, his striking is good, but not great. And it seems like, you know, the wrestling could very well be exploited. Luckily for him, he's taking on Mikey O, who has won pretty much no cardio. Um, two... Doesn't really wrestle, despite his ears looking like he knows how to grapple. He has some of the worst grappling in the middleweight division um, and former light heavyweight division. Like the guys constantly get submitted. For him, it's kind of, for Mikey O. It's pretty knockout or bust. Like he's gonna have to get a knockout in the first seven minutes, maybe. Or um, I just think he gets out volumed over and over and over in this fight. Like. And probably finish late. I'd be interested in like a Mega Madoff late prop. Maybe this squeeze into the third round because there's not too much of a submission threat. But there is an off chance that like Shara hasn't really been showing any sort of wrestling because he hasn't had somebody on this level where he would be confident that like, hey, if I take this guy down, even the stuff that I work on in the gym may actually work. Um, but yeah, it's going to be hard for me to back Mikey O against an undefeated Russian who hasn't been knocked out. Um, 
And that seems to be the only path to victory for Mikey O um, in the year 2024. So uh, give me the one-eyed bandit, Cody. What's your take? Yeah, it's a weird one. So on one hand, we always talk about potentially fading Shara because there, there's numerous red flags to his game. Him having one eye is not even the biggest of the red flags. <clears throat> but yeah, but it's all about opponent and opposition. And on one hand, I want to get behind uh, Mikhail Oleksiychuk. I think that he potentially could present some issues. On the other hand is that you look into him and he's still only 29 years old. And yet for this camp... He's abandoned actually having a camp. He's just training in his garage with a couple of buddies. And then I seen someone like in this like comment thread thing be like, if you lose and you get released, is there could we potentially see you in KSW? And he's like, no, nah, man, I'm done with this stuff. I'm going to retire. So I'm like, I don't know, man. It sounds like even at 29 years old, he's checked out. And again, go check out his social medias. He's not putting in any type of riveting camp. He's on a two fight losing streak. Uh, he's talking about if I get released here, that's is it for me. I, I just don't know how much committed he is. And the UFC has done a fine job of giving Shara these types of winnable guys. So, like, why bring in a guy on a two-fight losing streak to feed to your poster boy? Well, one, because he's predominantly a striker, so he's going to give you the type of fight that you want. Two, he's not even the you know, career best shape. And three, you know, it probably does get released if he loses this fight. So he's got one foot in, one foot out. Who knows? You know, as far as his striking style goes, listen, he's got better wins than Shara Magomedov. He's more experienced than Shara. He's got way more experience at this level. But the guy is very much a front runner. It's, he puts pace on people early and then just fades out that second and third round. Shara, meanwhile, yeah, you could argue he's the same thing. He doesn't have, exactly have the best cardio, but he has almost no MMA experience prior to signing to the UFC. Like, he went from Muay Thai to drumming a bunch of bums to build up a quick record and then just jumps into the UFC. So he's very much still... 30 but learning on the spot right and i do think his cardio will slightly get better fight to fight his grappling will get better fight to fight he just needs a little more experience that he has under his belt mikey O has that experience he just hasn't gotten any better now he didn't look terrible his last time out against kevin hall and you see what he does when he comes forward brings that pressure he can land some devastating shots he loves to work the body he's had some big career moments it just doesn't always go his way you look at his losses, it's generally when he's getting submitted, right? So if that's off the table here, then Shara's going to have to put him away. And shara has been throwing a lot of kicks. shara has been throwing a lot of volume. But I don't know that I would say Mike Yo still might have the this clear power advantage as well. So it seems like it's striker versus striker. Both guys got red flags. One guy's got issues with cardio. The other one's missing an eye. Um, it's going to be just your classic car crash of a fight where two men meet in the center and throw down. And yet one guy's a considerable favorite over the other. So... I'd love to brand it a dog or pass, but the gut feeling that I do have is that Mike Keogh is very much one foot in, one foot out, not looking to be there. Where Shara self-admittedly leaves Muay Thai because he's like, there is no money. He's right. He's right. There's no money in Muay Thai. Comes to MMA. Now he's two fights into the UFC. Now there's a little bit of hype. Now they're booking him as co-main events on some high-profile cards. Now he's starting to get a payday. Yeah, yeah. Again, you're, the best is yet to come from him, whereas the other guy, we've already seen it. Yeah, so Shara is the pick. Yeah, it all kind of. I think it really comes down to Mike Yo's got to get you out of there early. Um, he has. I mean, he just when's the last time he's been out? He hasn't been out of the. He's been out of the first round against Caio Baraglio, Got subbed in the second. But it's like he barely ever gets out of the first. I guess Mude, Modestus Bukakis in twenty twenty one. No, it doesn't Jacoby. So yeah, it's like he he has been, but it's like recently. It's been a it's been a long time since he's been out of the first round. Um, it's gonna probably have to get out of the first round here. It could be a lot more competitive than the line suggests, but I just don't have faith in Mikey O to go uh, three rounds, and I think he may need to go three rounds to get his hand raised in this fight. So, not yeah, I'm kind of on board with you that it's like I don't I'm not enticed by minus two twenty on Chera Magomedov, but. But, yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to pick him as well. Uh, we got Davison Figueredo taking on Marlon Chito Vera. Minus 140 for Davison Figueredo, the former 125 champion. Uh, Marlon Vera can be had for plus 125. The biggest uh, indictment against this fight, Cody, is that, like, this should be this should be five rounds. This should be a main event in, like, one of these Vegas cards at the Apex, at, at the very least. Or, you know, they should have went down to Brazil and had these guys headline like a fight night card or something like that. I'd love to see these guys go five rounds. And I think the the line would be so different in like where the action would come in on this. If this was a five round fight, I'm thinking Marlon Vera all day long. Just just in the fact that 
And frankly, both of these guys historically have been somewhat slow starters, but Marlon Vera more so. And he's like, he's given up so many first rounds over the course of his career that he gives up a first round to Davison here. It, it's probably going to be hard to get back. There has been some money coming in on Vera in the last, you know, 24 hours or so. He was up at like my, plus 155. It was like minus 180 or so for Davison. Um, it's really tough backing Vera pre-flop when, when it's kind of this price and I expect him to give up the first round just about against everybody. I'm going to side with uh, Figgy um, ever so slightly here. I think that maybe he can mix in a little bit of, little bit of wrestling, a little bit of grappling. Um, and... Uh, yeah, my problem always with three round fights with Vera, it's always going to come down to kind of the same issue: is that he gives up those early, early moments, those early like the first round so much that he doesn't have time to to play catch up anymore. So that's where I'm at with this one. What about you? Yeah, yeah. What I would have liked for this fight is that they shifted up to the co-main event and made it a five round co-main event because they yeah. have done that in the past. It's not crazy to think. And this is a far better fight than Shara versus Mikey. O. Way Are you kidding me? This is a former world champion versus a, a former world title challenger. Both guys are extremely exciting. Bantamweight division's you know, probably the best division in the UFC. And yeah, it's a Bantamweight headliner. I don't care if it's a Bantamweight co-main event. doesn't matter to me. But at least if that way somebody gets hurt, the other guy's already preparing for a five-round fight and could just get switched into that spot. So what do I know? But uh, all the same, yeah, I agree with you, is that the trouble with betting Marlon Vera, even though I want to, even though I think he's going to be the official pick here, is that he just gives up the first round. And if he gives up the first round and he's going to win the third round, then it comes down to that second and how quick it, he's going to turn it on. Problem with Davis and Figueredo is I expect him to gas the longer the fight goes, but I don't think it'll gas necessarily after 10 minutes. So it's very plausible that Davison just wins the first two. Marlon Vera does what Marlon Vera does in the third, starts to take over, starts to lend some damage, starts to wilt him a little bit, but it's just not enough. And that's what eventually gets it uh, it done for Davidson. It's just that early start. So there's a little bit of tentativeness there for sure. But when, when you look at it with Davidson Figueredo is that, yeah, he's just a big flyweight. He's a former flyweight champion. He uses his size in all of these spots. Moving up to Bantamweight, I feel like he's going to get exposed at some point. When you look at his last flyweight fight, which is him losing to Brandon Moreno, he had landed 19 significant strikes through 15 minutes and one takedown. That last flyweight fight for him was not a good one. Brandon Moreno took him down at will. He outstruck him at will. He put a beating on him. Then he moves up to 135 against Rob Font. And now he's all of a sudden rest, relying on his re wrestling, sorry, four takedowns. But again, only 45 significant strikes landed. By the numbers, very slightly, he got outstruck by Rob Font, but he got the takedowns. That fight that we watched with him, UFC 300, with Cody Garbrandt, Paul, it's the same thing. They fought for nine minutes, and in those nine minutes, he had only landed 13 significant strikes. He's actually getting outstruck 16 to 13, but he gets the takedown, and he gets the submission, and that's all fine and good, but it appears that the larger weight class, he's not some volume guy. He's worried about gassing out, which he did at 25, but now that you're wrestling and fighting bigger guys, you got to kind of conserve yourself and use those one big shots. Against Cody Garbrandt, not known for his chin and durability, Cody's got to be hesitant from that big power from Figueredo. Therefore, Cody's not really pressing the action. Figgy's not really pressing the action. He can conserve. Against Marlon, well, it's a different problem on your hands. He's constantly moving forward. He's constantly looking to exchange. Even if you do take him down, he's looking to scramble and get back up and make you work. And I feel like that pressure and that pace should break down Figgy. Figgy's just not throwing enough volume. And if, if he was to, you'd see him tire out a lot quicker. So when I look at Figueredo five foot five, you know, with a 68 inch each uh, 68 inch reach versus Marlon Vera's five foot eight. Like he's just, yeah. And people will make the argument, Cody Garbrandt's five, eight. He really isn't. And he's not that big of a bantamweight. weight. In fact, at one point he made 125 pounds. Marlon Vera has fought at 145 pounds. Like, trust me, he's a much larger man. And I feel like that could be ever so slightly the difference. So with Vera, his last couple performances, like he's not necessarily always dialed in. Like sometimes he's getting taken down and he's getting frustrated and he's looking up at the clock and it's ticking away and you're urging him like, dude, do something more. We can't have that here. We can't have that here. Him losing the first round, it's pretty much expected, but we he needs to fight with a sense of urgency the entire time and hope that Figgy slows down. So I'll take that slight underdog shot on Marlon Vera as well, but Again, it's a fight that you can make solid points for both sides. Yeah, the last thing I'll say about this fight is 
is that Sandhagen, so I mean the Vera versus Sandhagen fight, you know, rounds one, rounds two. Uh, you know, Sandhagen gets a takedown, gets two and a half minutes of top control. Um, and then in round two, gets another takedown, two and a half minutes of t- top control. In a three-round fight, yeah, now, we're, now we're in big trouble. Um, can Davidson get those takedowns? As a former flyweight, he is giving up a little bit of size. It's going to come down to the takedowns, I think, for Davidson. Um, he's not going to out-volume uh, Vera, but I do have concerns that Figgy's going to be able to get you know, takedowns in those first two rounds and then just kind of, you know, cruise, make it close, try to slow down the pace of the fight, win a decision. But, um, yeah, I guess we'll find out on Saturday. Moving on down, we've got Michael Chiesa taking on Tony Ferguson. Minus 700 for Michael Chiesa. El Kikui can be had for plus 500. Cody. <laughs> Like what? What is this? I know the the interesting thing about this fight is that it's at welterweight, and there was like maybe a few weeks ago, Kiesa tweeted it out that like he was like thirty five pounds more to cut because it was supposed to be at one hundred and fifty five pounds. So obviously they've negotiated, say, ah, eh, let's not cut the weight, let's go to one seventy. You know, both of them are former uh, former lightweights fighting at one seventy. I think Kiesa is the bigger frame. Kiesa, I mean, frankly, Kiesa hasn't won a fight in three years. Tony Ferguson hasn't won a fight in five years. It's been very, very ugly for both of them. I don't know how I could get to Kiesa or feel comfortable in laying minus 700 on Michael Chiesa against everyone. I understand Tony Ferguson. I mean, he got subbed by Bobby Green. It's bad. Like, it, it, it has never been so bad as it is right now for Tony Ferguson. It's probably his retirement fight, you know, win or lose. There's nothing great about it, Cody. Do, but I am kind of struck with, like, when I stare at this plus 500, do I plug my nose and bet Tony Ferguson? Because I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with like, with Michael Chiesa and his proclivity to get submitted. He leaves that neck out when he's shooting for takedowns all the time. And Tony's grappling ain't what it used to be, or at least it hasn't looked like it used to be. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. If, if, if wrestling gets negated in this fight, it's like I think Tony can very well win a you know, a volume-based decision against Michael Chiesa. I just think Michael Chiesa minus 700 is absolutely nuts. And it feels like a moment that I may plug my nose and just put a little bit of money on Tony Ferguson and probably lose. What's your take here? Yeah, I agree. I think if you were just looking for a wild PRP pick, last guy in the line, not a whole lot of confidence. I, I, I honestly think that Tony Ferguson could win this fight <clears throat> by way of the numbers extremely high plus big big plus money worth having a look but yeah it's almost like homer simpson effect right homer simpson just takes the beating takes the beating takes the beating and then eventually his opponent who's generally a you know a boxcar bum falls over from fatigue that's how he can potentially still win this fight unfortunately they've been matching up with justin gaethje a former champion charles Oliveira, a former champion benil Dariush, a high echelon guy michael chandler you know what, title challenger, Nate Diaz, title challenger, Bobby Green, Bobby Green, like you said, it's starting to fall off. But even in those last two fights, Bobby Green hits him 137 significant times, and then he chokes him out. So absolutely beats him pillar to post, does not fatigue, does not go away, puts him away. Patty Pimblett, Patty Pimblett just come off a career best performance. But in that fight with Tony Ferguson, he's lighting him up. He, be- he hits him 106 significant times. He drops him. He takes him down. In the third round, Paul, he is gassed out. Just from beating on Tony. So, like, if Tony has one last thing going his way, is that you need to Michael Chandler jungle kick him in the face. And if you don't, he just doesn't go anywhere. He's still there. That's the last thing he's got going for him. And that one little thing that he still has going for him is the one thing that Michael Chiesa has been missing his entire career, which is, like, resilience. His ability to take a little bit of damage and, and, you know, keep going. His ability to get tired and keep going. Michael Chiesa just doesn't have that. And you can blame it on the weight cuts. You can blame it on a bunch of things. It seems like it's a mental lapse. Like, there's guys that he has no business getting submitted by, like Vincente Luque, that he shoots a stupid takedown into and gives up a Dars choke. Last time out with Kevin Holland. 
even the fight with Sean Brady, it's like his cardio is just not there. If you think the guy's an elite grappler, which he can be at times, it's like his own mental relapses keep getting in his way. And as a result, he's a threat to get submitted. He's a threat to just flat out tire out. And even if he doesn't tire out and he doesn't get submitted, he's super low on volume. He's never been a guy to go out there and land these, these high strike performances. I think he did one time back in the day against Mitch Clark. And he, if you remember that fight, I remember you and I watched it together at like a Boston pizza or something, but uh, he gassed out. He gassed out after two rounds of punching on Mitch Clark. So Kies is a career one round kind of guy. The last time he won, I'll admit, he looked good in all those rounds against Neil Magny. But as you pointed out, that's three and a half years ago. He hasn't looked like the same guy since then. He hasn't fought a whole lot. He's been battling injuries. His body weight has just naturally gone up. He spent a lot of time working the desk instead of working these training camps. Like, it's all just stuff that you wouldn't want to know if you were betting a guy at minus 700, is all I'm getting at. Ferguson, meanwhile, there used to be a time where it was like, if you lose three straight in the UFC, you get cut. And then that got shifted to four straight. But it was like, if you lose four straight in the UFC, you're going to get cut. And then there'd be these super rare exceptions where a guy like Carlos Condit maybe lose five straight and they'd, they'd give him one more. And they're like, six straight, I, I don't know. Maybe Sam Alvey got like a six straight or something stupid like that because there was a, there was a draw mixed in or a no contest mixed in. But I've never in my life seen a guy in a seven-fight losing streak be offered another fight in the UFC. If he loses this, it would be a, a historic moment. He'd be the first and only guy in UFC history to ever flat out go on an eight-fight losing streak. So why keep him? Because there's still something there. His, his, his skills aren't completely shot to bits. It's that he's not what he used to be. All this, Every single guy in that, in that, uh, that list of seven that have beaten him are either former champions or in the case of Patty Pimblett and Bobby Green, guys that can still hang with that upper echelon, guys of the division. Kiesa, maybe not that. So I know I'm talking myself into a Tony Ferguson bet more than anything else, and it don't feel good. And you can't have any type of like real expectation here. But because of the line is so wide, I honestly do feel in my heart like it, it, it's closer than that. And for that reason, wild underdog pick, I think I'm going to go with Tony Ferguson as well. Wow. God have I mean I while you were talking there I was just like oh my god he's actually agreeing with me and then I God have I know mercy. it's wild. God have mercy on my soul I bet time. I bet Tony Ferguson <laughs> plus 500 and I'm expecting the worst but uh, hoping for the best it would be nice to see him get a win but like even even though there's like chatter about it being his retirement fight you know if Tony wins like he ain't going anywhere like well, this card was supposed to. He's one of the Nick few Diaz. guys that and actually Diaz... likes the grind of like training camp. He just like he would he'll be doing that stuff like after he's a fighter. He just like he just loves that stuff. Yeah, you know what? I went to high school with a guy named Curtis Crowley, right? And he'd fight every lunchtime, and he'd get beat every lunchtime. And this guy would just take a mopping, and then at the end of the fight, as the other guy was just walking away, he'd like get up and be like, "Man, you hit like a girl." The guy'd be like, "What?" And come down. Oftentimes, he'd get his ass kicked a second time in that lunchtime. I, I bet you this guy lost about 47 fights in the grade 9 and half of grade 10 year before his parents moved him uh, from schools. They said he was getting bullied, but, like, he had a big mouth on him. Regardless of that, I was like, i never seen the guy win a fight. I seen him lose a lot of fights every time because of his own mouth. But he'd get up and he'd just be like, what? What? You're done? You're a bitch. And then they'd be like, what? And they'd come back. Or sometimes, like, their buddy would be like, no, nah, man, it's over. It's over. And then they, he'd, he'd say something to the buddy, and the buddy would come and beat him up. And I remember thinking, like, man, that guy has confidence like i never seen in my life. And if he was just, like, actually in a gym with actual training partners and actual coaches, maybe he was a real fighter. He couldn't win a fight to save his life in that setting, but give him the skills and all that. He had something you couldn't teach. That's what Tony's got, dude. When he was the number one guy in the world, he was like, McGregor, you don't want to fight me? Khabib scared me. Now seven fight losing streak later. Talents shot to bits. Reflexes shot to bits. Tony Ferguson is still on Twitter like, Shh, Khabib don't want no part of me. Like, it, it doesn't affect him at all. At all. And the last fight he gets with David Goggins, right? And he's doing all this, like, this mind stuff and this crazy cardio. And then he fights Patty Pimblett, and it doesn't make a lick of difference. No. Then afterwards, he's like, man, I knew I shouldn't have been training with those guys. Like, I just got to do what I was doing beforehand, training myself. It's like, that was the sixth fight losing streak was doing that. <laughs> One time you tried to shake it up, still no difference. And now... But what I'm getting at is, like, if you can't break his confidence that he believes, whether it's mental illness or not, he believes that he's still the best guy in the world. And confidence goes a long way. Because, again, I think that's what Kiesa is lacking. Doesn't fight all that often. He's on a three-fight losing streak of his own. When he gets caught in a bad position, he's the first one to tap. 
Ferguson not like that, dude. He's still very much about it. So I know it sounds crazy, but crazier things have happened. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED lights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you always find what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, we got Mac Dern taking on Lupita Godinez, minus 120 for Dern, plus 100 for Lupita Godinez. Who do you got here? Yeah, honestly, like, I just really don't know. On one hand, Lupita Godinez should win the fight. She's the better wrestler. She's the better boxer. All she really has to do is sprawl and brawl Mackenzie Dern, who's never really had much success with the takedown accuracy. In Dern's last two fights, she's gotten roughed up bad. Mm -hmm. Starting off with that Jessica and Draj fight, the four knockdowns, you could just see her, like, not, I don't want to be here anymore, but just, like, I'm tired of getting hit. And it was kudos to her that she even came back to fight Amanda Lemos. But the Lemos fight was much of the same. She may get a takedown. She may get a back take. But if she doesn't get that quick submission, and at this level in 2024, like quick submissions are not necessarily always on the table. As good of a grappler as she is, she seems to just get unreal positional control on you on the ground. And then the round ends, you get back up, and then she can't get that takedown a second time. So in theory, again, this is just theory. I don't think Lupita Godinez gives up more than one takedown, so she should be able to just keep it standing and box her up for two or three rounds and win the decision. On the other hand, is that Mackenzie Dern does have a knack for just getting into positions, like her fight with Tisha Torres, for example, where she basically pulls guard on a Kimura, but that gets the fight to the ground, and now she's in an offensive position. Her fight with Lemos, she does get a position where she's able to get the fight to the ground. There's been moments where she's able to get these fights to the ground. And with Lupi, Lupi tends to just give up positions you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. you could go even back to loopy's debut when people tried to warn me and i didn't listen but against jessica panay it was like well panay shot to bits is, hasn't fought in three years and is not really good at anything so how how would she beat loopy and it's like well she's got a good back take and that alone beat loopy loopy's winning the fight loopy's boxing her up loopy's stuffing the takedowns but one transition allows her opponent to get on top or to grab the back or to just neutralize her and she ends up losing her fight with Angela Hill you know she gave up a takedown to Angela Hill but beyond that she fought a terrible game plan her fight with Luana Carolina unbelievably terrible fight she couldn't take Luana Carolina to the ground and ends up in a bunch of bad spots clinched up getting knee ends up losing that fight her last time out against Verna Verna's an excellent grappler so it's I, I don't expect Mackenzie Dern to come out with that same type of takedown game but I almost do wonder if pulling guard and hitting a sweep or you know hitting a duck under and just getting one hook in it up against the fence like if Mackenzie Dern's able to just capitalize on two bad loopy mistakes then that's two rounds that she can take the back and neutralize her then she is going to win this fight as far as it being standing loopy does have the better boxing Mackenzie Dern's striking's never really looked comfortable but Dern still does have some decent power. She could take a decent punch. I don't think Loopy stings her or puts her away. So that's 15 minutes of having to mine your P's and Q's against this high-level BJJ black belt that's looking to capitalize on specific moments. So, you know, if Pat would just spam underdog plus money women's MMA fights like this, and then that's been a winning recipe for him over the years, like, I, I don't doubt it. It's women's MMA. It's always hotly contested. And this is a fight that you could be winning but make a few mistakes and end up losing. So... My gut tells me, I don't know, my gut tells me go Dern, but like my head is trying to just get that gut feeling out of here and just go with Loopy. And because I took a wild underdog the last time out and I already got Marlon Vera upper on the card, I, I'm not going to force a whole bunch of them. So I'll stick with the favorite here, Loopy Godinez, but it's going to be lower on the list this week. Loopy's the underdog. Is she the underdog? I mean, it's, it's pretty much move? a pick em. It's like ever oh, so, it's like it's, a, it's minus 120 plus 100. And actually, yeah, so as I move. look, updated odds right now. You can get like plus 107, plus 110 is like top of market for Loopy. I don't really have much to say to like what you, like. I don't have much to add to like what you said there. It's like, yeah, my head 
says that like Lupi's the much better striker, can put up way more volume. Um, is just much a much better technician on the feet, and Dern is not great at wrestling, but Dern, as you kind of you perfectly kind of said, it's just like she's just good at like getting into like you know, getting into weird mad scrambles. Like, I don't think she's gonna give Loopy too much respect on her strike. So it's like she's gonna be mad dogging, running forward, and um and being super, super aggressive. Uh, and, and in those types of like chaotic moments, maybe she can get a back take and, and, you know, get the fight to the mat in a different way other than, you know, traditional wrestling. Um, that's how I think she wins the fight. But, you know, my head is telling me that like loopy, you know, volume in the striking ability to stop, you know, regular wrestling should be able, should be enough to give, give her the nod. And when she's an ever so slight underdog, it's like, I would be forced to kind of, you know, take Loopy in this spot. But, um, and yeah, Loopy being able to go the distance against Verna um, looks even more impressive in hindsight, obviously, with like Lamash getting taken down, neutralized, and then subbed super, super quickly. It's like, you know, MMA is a crazy, a crazy, you know what. So who knows? Maybe Dern comes out here, creates a massive scramble. And, uh, and and gets the back and sinks in something like it's. I mean, she's got the capability to do that against anybody, and her durability is great. But um, I'll side with Loopy on the uh, on volume and just don't engage, stay away at all costs, and you should be able to, you know, win a volume based decision here. All right, we got Joel Alvarez taking on Elvis Brenner. Minus 190 for Alvarez, plus 165 for Elvis Brenner. This should be an absolute banger, Cody. Who you got? Uh, I think I'm going to go with Joel Alvarez. Uh, you kind of got to wait for Wayans to see what he looks like because he is gigantic. And he's missed weight two times of this weight class already. I think he came in. Let me just bring it up. He came in against Alexander Yakovlev at 159 and a half pounds. And then his fight with Tiago Moises, he came in at 157 and a half pounds. But that's because he's a very large man. And when you look at Elvis Brenner, who's five foot ten, uh, in comparison to Joe Alvarez at six foot three, you're gonna see very clearly in there that one guy's twice the size. To me, that very much is the difference maker. Elvis Brenner is a gamer. He's willing to come forward, he's willing to mix it up with you, he's willing to exchange, but he seems a little bit undersized. If he takes on guys that are also about his size then yeah, he can stay in their face and make it aggressive. If you're going to gas like the Gurung Kudalits fight, then yeah, he can capitalize. He's been an upset specialist to this point of his uh, UFC career. And I think this is where it ends, man. Uh, I go back to that Guram fight against Kudalits. The first round, Guram Kudalits mauls him. I think he you know, strikes him like 30 to 7 in the first round. Like It's a beatdown. But Guram just throws too much into it and gasses himself out. The second round, Guram still, in my opinion, edges. But now he's running on fumes in the third and Elvis puts him away in the third. That last time against uh, Orlebi, Milbeck Orlebi, you see even they're both 5'10", is that he just looks like the smaller guy. His physicality is not quite there. Orlebi is beating him up handedly on the feet, but for whatever reason, every time he gets Brenner really rocked, he takes him down. Five takedowns, but without those five takedowns, I think he just puts him away on the feet. Joel Alvarez, meanwhile, like his striking's ne not necessarily been his go-to. His go-to is his wicked good BJJ. You want to take this guy down, you are in a lot of trouble. He'll throw up arm bars, triangles. He's got long limbs, as you would expect with a six foot three frame, and he's very physically strong. Thing is, is that to this point of his UFC career, he's shot zero takedowns. Not completed zero takedowns. He's attempted zero takedowns. He's not looking to take you down. If you want to take him down, so be it. But he's looking to put a beating on you standing. And whereas I wasn't fully sold on that initially, that fight with Thiago Moises, where he just walks right through him and blasts him to bits with standing elbows, you know, that's a solid performance. Um, his last time out against Mark Diacasey, against Diacasey's looking to take him down, and he walks into the submission. How does he match up with Brenner? Well, he's way bigger than Brenner, so Brenner's going to do this classic fight in the pocket, try to press forward style, and move forward constantly on him, try to fight within that, you know, that inner range. Joel Alvarez, meanwhile, because he's got this long-ass reach advantage, long-ass height advantage, I think he just intercepts him with knees up the middle, elbows up the middle. If he wants to clinch up with him, he's going to be the bigger, taller guy that's able to just constantly be that threat, lifting those knees, working the body. If Brenner wants to take him down, so be it. I think Alvarez has the advantage there. If Brenner ends up falling and ending up on his back or giving up his neck with a sloppy takedown, 
Alvarez will capitalize. Last but not least, Orlovay had Brenner out there multiple times. Like, if that same same type of punishment comes here from Alvarez, I think he does find the spot and put him away. So, Brenner's been great if you can get him a big, big plus money because he generally delivers when he's not necessarily expected to. But uh, he can only give away with giving up this much size for a long time. And I feel like Alvarez, if he's healthy and he's in shape, guy's got a lot of skills. I'm excited to see him back. Yeah, the only guarantee in this fight is just violence, to be perfectly Fight honest. of the night, more like than it's gonna be. It's going to be... I, I, I struggle to see how it doesn't really deliver. Because, yeah, Elvis Brenner... I mean, Elvis Brenner got two ta or three takedowns against Mick Tebek Orobai last time. I was giving up a lot of size there. Obviously, he was taken down five times as well. But in this fight, I mean, you know, Joel Alvarez's submission abilities have been... You know, he's, he's been able to capitalize a few times over the course of his UFC career. I expect these guys kind of to, to fight at range. If this fight gets into deep waters, I'm not sure how Al Alvarez will handle that. That's the real kind of key for me. Um, Pre-flop, the pick will be Joel Alvarez, but I'll be looking for... If, if Brenner can get out of, like... If Be Brenner can get this deep into, like, the late second round, I think the tides could change. I think it's probably from like a money line perspective, pretty accurate, you know, mathematically in terms of like winning percentage here. But um, yeah, it's a fight I'm looking forward to, but not exactly going to be spamming too much um, uh, on the money lines. I will be looking to like, you know, fight ends inside the distance minus 200. I think that's my favorite way to attack that fight, to be perfectly honest. All right, moving on down, we've got Azamat Mirzakhanov taking on Alonzo Menafield. Mirzakhanov, a minus 200 favorite. Menafield can be half a plus 170. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, they kind of both guys a little bit mirror each other. Menafield is low volume, but just huge power. And a lot of the times he'll be getting it worked in these fights, whether it be by volume, whether it be by takedowns. But his great equalizer is that right hand. I mean, if he touches you, he definitely can uh, change the tide of a fight. You look at him versus Dustin Jacoby, he's getting it at work the entire time. But again, it's just like land one shot and then Dustin Jacoby's either knocked down or he's wobbling. And at the end of it, I believe he got it worked. I believe Dustin Jacoby won the fight, but the judges don't agree because they're looking for power and damage. And even though Men of Field is, doesn't got a ton of gas, it's, it's, he can pick and choose those spots and allow that to you know be the difference maker. As a, or as a Matt Mirzakhanov, He's the same thing, dude. We used to call him Murdakanov because he will murder you if he hits you, man. We saw in his debut against Tafan and Jaqui. He's not doing anything. He's getting it worked. And he's getting it worked. And then a beautiful flying knee up the middle just absolutely takes Jaqui out of there. That's what he's capable of. You'd love to see him throw more of it, but he doesn't necessarily do it all the time. His fight with Devin Clark, third round knockout, lands 79 significant strikes there. Didn't mind it. Not a ton of volume, but again, he's got the power, the, the, the difference maker. And his last time out against Dustin Jacoby, it, it reminded me a lot of the Menafield fight. I thought Dustin Jacoby was potentially winning. He's outworking him. He's outlanding him. But Merzikhanov lands those bigger shots. He wobbles him. He drops him. And that is the difference maker and gets him the decision victory. So now you have two guys going in there. I don't really expect either guy to engage that much in the grappling. I could see Menafield using his superior upper body size to maybe lean on Merzikhanov in the clinch and up against the cage just to, you know, wear him down a little bit. But I think it's going to be both guys standing in the center for the most part, staring at each other, waiting for the opening to unleash that one big shot. Feels to me like Merzikhanov has slightly better volume. He has slightly better punch selection. And beyond all that is that the guy's undefeated. He's never been knocked out. Whereas you look at Menafield, he just got knocked out in 12 seconds. And beyond that, his fight with OSP, which you'll remember back in the day, he looked awful and then eventually gets deaded with a head kick or a check left hook. So I know mirzakhanov has got the better durability, I believe. Even though they're both low volume, he's proven to have slightly better volume. And both guys got great power. So if that's going to be... All th if that's going to be equal, then give me the guy with slightly better durability and slightly better volume. So uh, Mirza Kanov would be the play for me. Slightly better cardio as well, I would say. Even like Menafield has had, you know, fights that have went to decision, but it always looks real gross awesome. as, the, as the fight rolls on. But wouldn't be too surprised by this being like really, really low volume affair and maybe the cardio issues don't show up as much for Menafield. Um, let's face it, though, we're... We're in Abu Dhabi. One guy's got an OV. 
if it does go to decision between the two of these guys in a relatively low volume fight, I'm going to, you know, wager that uh, a guy named Azamat will uh, will have the better chance of getting a little bit of, uh, you know, home cooking. Um, I'm not too confident in it, though. It's like I think Mirzakhanov is giving up, give, give me a couple couple inches in height. Like, I think five inches in reach. Like, no doubt in my mind that one guy is a proper light heavyweight and one guy could probably be a middleweight in this fight um, between the two of them. So, technique for technique. I think Mirzakhanov's got him. Manafield's always live to land like an absolute bomb, but yeah. No, I'm with you. I think uh, uh, Mirzakhanov is the pick for me as well. We got uh, Kayu. Fernandez taking on Mohamed Yaya. Minus 400 for Fernandez, plus 330 for Yaya. Kawe, Kawe, How do I say that, Cody? I don't know. Kawe? 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 I call him Kawe. From Nova, Nova Unyao. I was thinking about the other day, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, feels like there's a changing of the guard. With the fighting nerds right now in, in Brazil. Nova Union was like the number one gym in Brazil for the longest time, obviously. And like, who does Nova Union have these days? It's it kinda, like those training rooms used to be like kind of legendary, right? But it's like, I'm looking like through their gym right now. And like even Nicolau, I believe Nicolau trains in Florida. So he's shouldn't probably be listed there. Um, yeah, it really does feel kind of like a changing of the guard these days. Like, you know, I like guess Luan Lucerta, like it's just, they don't really have any top end, top end talents. People are leaving, leaving Rio going to, uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, do you have any hot take on this one? Like, it seems kind of jarring to see, you know, a contender series guy minus 400, but yeah, yeah, wasn't exactly making any, you know, wasn't really gaining any fans in his UFC debut either. Yeah, no, I don't really have any hot take for the most part. Uh, Nova Union, yeah, just touching on that point. That's just like the trend in MMA. Like, if you look back to MMA first starts, it's like, oh, it's the Lion's Den with Ken Shamrock. And then they're a mega gym. They have all the great challengers and great champions, and then they just absolutely vanish off the map. And it's Militich fighting system with Pat Militich. He's got Matt Hughes. He's got Tim Sylvia. He's got Jens Pulver. He's got Jeremy Horn. He's got, you know, a, a, just a wicked good plethora of of talent and then boom the gym just absolutely disappears and craig jackson's gym boom jackson wink and they've got all the greats you know they got george st pierre they got sugar rashad evans and keith jardine and that wh wh where's greg jackson's at and so no vinyan has much of the same it's like when you look at these great gyms it's like it's so hard to be great forever because you constantly need talent coming in and out of the doors and that's why i got respect for the american kickboxing academy and you know american top team these gyms that are able to stick around for a long time but even in aka's situation it's like they've got kane velasquez daniel cormier and habib Nurmagomedov, and all those guys retire now you still got islam makachev but what do you have beyond him what's the next level like, it's so hard to keep up with the times that these other little obscure gyms like fight ready mma in arizona will take their turn and have a legitimate roster of guys but 10 years down the road, somebody else takes over. So it's just the shifting of the gears in mixed martial arts, man. It's a crazy sport. It's ever evolving. And even on the betting side of things, you look back at these cards 10 years ago, it's like this guy is very one dimensional versus somebody who's slightly better in that area. But nowadays it's like, they're all very well rounded and because they got contender series and there's five other organizations and the UFC is cutting guys like Francis Ngannou or Mohamed Mokayev. They don't necessarily have the best guys anymore, and they're replacing them with guys from the Contender Series. And those guys from the Contender Series, uh, you know, just lack this and that. I, it's just a wild game. And this fight is the same thing. you got Kawe Fernandez, who's not good. He's not a good fighter. Comes from LFA. Uh, you look back his fight with this Luan Sardinia back in 2021, which is his last loss prior to his UFC debut. And uh, wins the first round, dynamic striking, and then beyond that, he just gasses. Once he gasses, he gets taken down. Once this man's on his back, he ain't getting back up. He's got suspect cardio. He's got no get-up game. He's not somebody that has well-rounded skill set, and he's not someone that should be in the UFC. They bring him in against Mark Dia Casey. It's a split decision. I don't know in what possible world someone scored the, the, a, a fight for him. How? Yeah, he's slightly outlanded Dia Casey, but he's completely getting neutralized the entire time. So there's quite literally nothing to like from Fernandez, and yet he's a minus 400 favorite. And why is that? 
Well, that's because Muhammad Yaya got taken only out on four this card. times by Trevor Peak. <laughs> yeah, like he he's he's the Abu Dhabi Warriors champion, 155 pound champion, the UAE Warriors 155 champ. So because they're in Abu Dhabi, they decide, hey, let's let's have him on the card, and they bring in Trevor Peak for no other reason than Trevor Peak would be considered probably the lowest ranked, if not one of the lower ranked lightweights on the card, right? Mm. And yet Peak takes him down four times and manhandles him, beat him on the feet, but was also just able to power the guy down whenever need be. Cardio checked out, beat the local guy. Judges couldn't even rob you because it was that clear and concise. It's a it's a bad look. Now, could he be getting better? Maybe, but grappling is clearly not his thing. When you watch his regional show fights, that's how he prefers to get it done. When I look at this fight with Kawhi, it's like, uh, I think Fernandez is a much better striker. He could definitely beat him on the feet standing early. But Trevor Peak didn't really want to engage this guy. He relied on his wrestling in that spot. So if the guy's got a decent chin and Fernandez doesn't knock him out in the first round, then it's entirely possible that in the middle of the desert, when it's cooking hot, that this little Brazilian guy with bad cardio is going to gas out. And then all of a sudden, a guy who's a giant underdog is able to lean on him and win a second or third round because they're close and they're hotly contested and he's the hometown guy and they'd love to see him get a win in Abu Dhabi and all of a sudden this minus 400 bet you have looks awful so yeah that's what I'm thinking here it's like I'm thinking it's a very plausible underdog play but it's a guy that I have no liking at this point the reason I'm going to end up going with Fernandez not just because he's some big favorite because DKC comes in with that D1 DKC game plan where it's mm -hmm. like he's looking to take you down over and over. So Kawhi was taken down over and over in that spot. I don't know that Yahya does that. In fact, he got soundly out wrestled by Trevor Peak, so I would rate his wrestling as nothing. So therefore, Fernandez should be able to keep this fight standing and utilize his superior striking. But the gas tank is the big worry, so keep your eye on that one. Yeah. Yeah, probably um yeah, Fernandez makes this fight easier for, for himself by by Leon the wrestling. And he was able to get one takedown against Mark Dia Casey. Um, you know, it was one for one. Dia Casey won one for one in round one, but one for four in round two, one for three in round three. So uh, we're talking about probably pretty low level wrestling, but the game plan for you if you're Cowie Fernandez is like if you watch the Trevor Peak fight, you're like I can do that. Hey, like, uh, train a little, you know, spam some takedowns and, uh, and and make it easy on yourself here. Maybe maybe even can find a submission while you get onto the mat. Because, yeah, I know, uh, Trevor Peak is your boy, but, like, I don't know if he's got, like, any sort of submission skills at this level in the shed whatsoever. Um, it'll be interesting, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, like, Fernandez by sub what uh what that's all about when when all of the books release per, uh, props on that all right we got shamil gaziev taking on dante Mays. gaziev a minus 220 favorite maze can be had for plus 180 the uh gaziev hype train Ooh, ooh. That, that that absolutely fell off of a cliff there buds Hey, we were on Rosen's truck, so... I know I mean, we were. I don't know how much of a hype train there, he was. He was but... a favorite against J uh, Jire Z. That's why it was a good play against him. <laughs> I know, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, it was kind of kind of wild. It's like, well, well who is this guy beating? And then, sure enough, goes out there and outstruck 120... Jire Zeno is usually not, like, a volume guy by any stretch of the imagination. So when Jire Zeno, you know... He's putting up 47 significant strikes in round three, 48 significant strikes in round four. It's like, you know that Z Gyrozinho has zero respect for what is coming back. It started a little bit, you know, more tentative, 13 to eight, 19 to seven. But yeah, round three, round four, Gyrozinho is just like, oh, this guy's not on my level. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess Shamil obviously... Can uh, beating Martin Budai, Budai kind of needs to be able to muscle you around, hold you up against the cage. And he wasn't able to do that against Shamil. Shamil's a big body. Um, I don't know, man. Heavyweight, low level heavyweight here. I've never really been the biggest Dante Mays guy, but he's shown enough offensive wrestling earlier in some of his fights, you know, Parisian, so on and so forth. Um, he's been able to kind of keep it, keep it standing in a lot of his uh in his most recent uh in his most recent fights here 
I just think like it's going to be really, I'm going to be very, very hard pressed to get to Shamil Gaziev at minus 220. It'll be a dogger pass type of situation for me. Your thoughts? Yeah, Gaziev, I feel like the loss is probably good for him because he was a highly touted heavyweight prospect. I didn't see it. I didn't think this guy looked all that good. But like anything, 34 is not super old at heavyweight. And when you're beating guys all the time, you don't have to go readdress your issues. And his issues being is that his cardio is not all that good. He's able to get quick finishes, but if he gets extended, it's not going to go well. Fading him wasn't simply because he's trash. It was because it was a five-round fight. Rosenstruck has fought a bunch of five-round fights, has great cardio, and is a guy that knocked out Alistair Overeem with like 13 seconds left in a 25-minute long fight so he can carry that power. That was the plan. And again, Gaziev has a good first round against Rosenstruck. Two, three, and four, it's right off a cliff. Hopefully now he goes back to the drawing board, readdresses it, and if he comes in with a slightly better cardio, this is just a three-round fight. Win those first two rounds, he could be okay. Now again, he does show a lot of these quick finishes, whether it be knockout, whether it be by submission, but him and his best is him leaning on you and him using that wrestling. And I feel like that's going to be the path here against Dante Mays. Mays, I'm going to go ahead and say his takedown defense pretty terrible. And it's always been terrible. Back on the Contender Series, he got taken down twice by Alan Crowder. He gave up a takedown to Mitchell Sipe. He gave up three takedowns to Surreal Gone, who's not a wrestler in the slightest bit. Two against Rodrigo Nascimento. He got taken down by Roque Martinez. He got taken down three times by Hamdi Amdelwab, or what was his name? Abdel Wahab. Hamdi Anal Swab. Um, that's what you always call him, which is hilarious. But that that one is the outlier. The that other was ones like I don't a, care as that, much about. Handy, handy was like a well. One handy ended up getting a um, a, a, a suspension yeah. for drugs after yeah, but he's that. He's terrible, and he's like he's an terrible. Egyptian like wrestling Olympia. qualifier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you want to give him a pass that Hamdi's able to take him down? No big deal. But I know I like down, Handy cost me a whole bunch of money. I was the one getting anal money. swabbed after that one was done, Coates. Cost everybody money because my point being is that Dante Mays was supposed to win that fight. He's supposed to win a bunch of these fights. His grappling generally ends up being the difference maker. At range, he's very long, you know, six foot seven. He has a good jab. He's got a good low kick. Um, I don't think he's got a ton of power, but at times, the Andre Arlovsky fight, I suppose, at times maybe he lands that right hand. But for the most part, it's touch and go, you know, point style fighting. His takedown defense, his offense not terrible. As you mentioned, sometimes he'll offensively try to take you down. He has been a training partner with John Jones in the past. He's not a complete fish out of water. It's that when he does get taken down and he does end up on his back, he's just got no get-up game. His legs are way too long. He doesn't create enough space. He doesn't have this, this quick explosiveness to him. He's generally a boxer. He's a little flat-footed on the outside. Someone that's willing to come forward, be aggressive, pin him up against the cage, drag him to the ground, and uh, over over you know, overpower him for two of the three rounds, that's going to yield a lot of success. And I feel like that's what Shamil Gaziev should be able to do. In the clinch, he should be the bigger, stronger, not bigger, but the, the stronger man. Muscle him up to the cage. If you can get him down, great. If not, just work him from that inside. Don't fight him at range because that's where he'll be at his best using that that superior distance. Um, ultimately, I feel like Gaziev makes the adjustments and he's either, either able to clip him or just get a hold of them and neutralize them. Score some takedowns, score some points on the judges' scorecards, and ultimately get the decision victory. He went one for seven on takedowns against Jair Zinho Rosenstrike. He, because he waited till he was gassed out, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, he I'm He tried three on a... times in round one. That's when he got his one. Yeah, One exactly. for three, he, 0 he for got two. The one. Now, he's, now he's gassed out, and he can't get them beyond the first round. Yeah. What if he? Uh, what if D1 Dontail shows up? Stuffs those takedowns. It's possible. He's gonna be gassed Listen, it's in an, round it's two. A middling, it's a middling heavyweight fight. Just take the underdog. You can if you want. Dante May sucks, right? He barely just oh, yeah. beat Ko Machado. Uh, I mean, I thought I he lost against Kyo, and I had bet Kyo. I know, and I had him, and the whole time it's just like this guy. And why do I keep doing this? Like I had him over Hamdi, and every time I watch him, I'm like, this man is atrocious. Mm -hmm. And 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 when I watch Gaziev, I think to myself, Gaziev is awful, and yet I still think Gaziev beats him. So. Just you don't want to be having a ton of investment in these fights. I get it. You know, maybe hit an over because it's one of those slow paced bog of a heavyweight fights that that nobody uh, finishes early. And all of a sudden they're both tired and they're both not doing much. Like maybe it's just a hit the over type fight. But unfortunately, I got to pick one guy or the other. I'm going to edge towards Gazio. Fair enough. All right. We got Gurum Kutataladze taking on Jordan Vucenic. Minus 200 for Guron, plus 170 for Vucenic, who you got? 
You know, on one hand, it seems like Guram could have been everyone's baby. I mean, debuts in the UFC as a colossal underdog against Matus Gamrot. <clears throat> Matus Gamrot, 18 and 0 at the time. And even though there's a strong argument that maybe Gamrot should have won that fight, I think for a UFC debut as a giant underdog, Guram Kudalat showed everything you'd want to see. He's very strong. Uh, individual, excellent striking, takedown defense, not bad. He's got good counter grappling. He's a training partner of Kamzat Chemaev. You know, trains at All Star in Sweden. There's a lot of good things that you could like about this guy. That debut, though, that was about as good as it got. The next fight against Demir Ushmagulov, again, a spirited fight. His cardio is not necessarily great. A um, couple poor choices, I guess, in the cage leads to Ushmagulov getting the decision. But again, just fought Demir Ishmagulov competitively. Sky is the limit for this guy. Then he then he draws Elvis Brenner. That one's a little less convincing, right? He has an excellent first round. He puts him on in the first round, but he does not pace himself. This is a guy that is very powerful, is very physically strong, but again, without that experience on how to utilize it, and he's generally just blowing his load too fast. That's how he fought Gamrot. It's how he fought Demir. It's how he fought Elvis. Now you throw in some injuries in the mix and another layoff. He's getting older. He doesn't fight all that often due to the injuries, and he's probably injured because he trains the way he fights, which is 100 miles an hour every single time. So... The guy is Georgian, and that should tell you everything you need to know. He's very physically strong. He's a, you know, a dog on a bone when he's in there. But you know, maybe he's overexerting himself ever so slightly. I think he could beat anybody in the same breath. He can lose to a lot of these guys based on that second round. He'll win the first. He'll lose the third. What happens in the second? Does he have enough to get over that that mid range point? Jordan Vukinich, meanwhile, this is the Cage Warriors champion, and there's a lot that you could like about him. He's got experience. He's been booked in these five round fights before. He's a guy that actually should be in the UFC, as far as I'm concerned, anyways. Like, he's got a solid body of work. Uh, when you look at his, he's got a win over this Morgan Sherrier, who's in the UFC now. Mm -hmm. That fights at 145, right? Then he fights at James Hedden, 145. Loses to Paul Hughes at 145. So now that he's come, jumping into the UFC here and taking on a large 55er, I know that he has fought at 55 himself. In fact, he missed weight his last time out. But I, I think he has more of the frame as a 45er. The loss to Paul Hughes, though, it's all wrestling-based. Like, the first two rounds, or no, the first three rounds, Paul Hughes just takes him down at will. That by the longer the fight goes, he's just now disinterested. Takedown defense is largely an issue for him. Problem is, Guram doesn't shoot those offensive takedowns. So, Jordan wants to strike. He's an excellent striker. He's excellent Muay Thai. Very good kicks. Very good punching combinations. Guram will give him that fight. The worry is that Guram just tries to smoke him out of the water in the first round. And if he doesn't, then Jordan's going to slowly in the second and the third work his way back into it. If Guram wants to wrestle him, that's the path to victory. But so far, he's not really shown a ton of that in his career. So I almost feel like this is a great live betting situation that you'll get Jordan at a better live number after the first round. But pre-fight pre flop, you know, it looks like Guram's going to be one hell of a task for the guy. I, I think I'm going to lean... I want to take the coward's way out and just take Guram. He's had the full camp. You know, I like what he brings to the table. Uh, he is obviously the power striker, but with Jordan's best superior durability, his ability to keep these fights close, you know, he's short notice, but he doesn't have to t cut a ton of weight. I feel like I might take that underdog shot in Jordan Vucinic to uh, get a spring the upset in his debut. Much the same that Guram Kudelitz sprung an upset in his UFC debut. Maybe Jordan can uh, some, surprise some people and get the win. Pretty short notice, though. Was was Vucinic getting ready for anything else? Well, he and just obviously he like, did, and he, he missed weight like 20, at 155. 23 days ago. Yeah. Okay. But he missed weight. Yeah, he missed weight by a pound and a half, which is a weird one because his one fight prior against Simone Don is 145, and then he moves up to 155 for his debut, and he misses. But I think that one got thrown short notice together because... He's beating all of their best uh, regional show guys, 6-1. and one. You know, mm -hmm. he fights Paul Hughes twice. He fights this 8-0 kid, and then he fights Adrian Keppa, who's 12-8. and eight. Like, it's a stay busy. Hey, man, you want to just compete for the sake of competing? And I don't know, maybe his weight was off, but it's a solid performance. He gets a first-round submission. I think the kid can fight later into fights. I think his striking is good, and most of his opponents will try to neutralize him. That's how you beat him, is you neutralize him by taking him to the ground. If Guram's not going to do that... He should show the best version of himself. He's got nothing to lose. UFC debut, expected underdog, short notice. Um, you know, I bet against Jake Hadley last week on the basis of short notice, up a weight class, and the kid's just not that good. It doesn't matter, man. It's like short notice, up a weight class. It was the best version of him that I'd seen yet. He looked the best that he has yet. Absolutely stumps Lothran. Makes me look like an idiot. And and what? He was on short notice, up a weight class. And he missed weight, too. He came in at 137. So... Sometimes it's like none of that stuff matters, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
There was what? There was that um, Brazilian kid a few weeks ago. He kind of came in on short notice. A lot of these these guys coming in on short notice have have put on pretty good performances. I mean, every the you know in the year twenty twenty four, everyone's they know that like if if you're the Cage Warriors champion, it's just like you know that your phone could be ringing at any time. So it's like stay relatively close to to fight weight because. These types of opportunities will present itself from everything that I kind of gathered there. And it sounds like if the fight does go to the mat, Vujinic has like, you know, quite a bit of quite a good number of submissions on his record. Um, seems like he's probably a pretty good matchup uh, as a plus 170 underdog against Gurum Kutatiladze. Gurum, yeah, that, that first fight against Gamrod, it looked like, oh, this guy's going to be a world beater. But it's like, you can kind of say the same thing. Maybe it's like, with Hamzat and him, it's just like that whole, everything fell off a cliff. You could have told me, you know, when Gurum made that debut, it was right around the same time that, like, Hamzat looked like the future lord of 170 and 185. And, my God, the, uh, the, the script has completely flipped on all of that. Um, Gurum... I mean, even against Brenner, it's like it was pretty competitive. And then, yeah, he obviously cooked himself and then got finished late. But I don't know. I, I, I question, you know, how much time those guys are putting in at, uh, at, at All-Stars these days, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I was just going through his Instagram. It's like, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, there's one video where they're shadow boxing him and... Um, him and Shamayev are shadow boxing. That one's from like over, or that one's from six weeks ago. I just, I mean, from the from the outside looking in, I just don't really see, um, you know, the improvements being made. So, kind of interesting because like we would have thought that those guys were going to be like two guys to watch as they they climbed the rankings, and it's story didn't shake out that way. All right, we got Dudakova taking on. Uh, Sam, Sam Page Hughes, minus 170 for Dudakova, plus 150 for Sam Page. This one screams, Cody. It's it, This one just looks just so, so much to me like your, uh, your, your classic Pat Mayo yeah. CF dot model. And the reasons why I kind of, you know, look at it this way is, you know, Yasmin Wariki. Last time out there against Dudakova, or sorry, against uh, Sam Hughes. There was no takedowns going on there, but Sam Hughes got 83 significant strikes against a highly touted, you know, uh, prospect in Warriki. I know Warriki got knocked out by Denise Gomes, but she's got a lot of skills. On top of that, she went to this, she got taken down, went to decision against Amarim, who's got great BJJ. Um, and, you know, went to decision, got the decision win. Um, she's just a grinder. She makes things, you know, tough. She makes fights tough out there. And you go through, like, what Dudakova's been up to. Um, the Jin Yu Frey fight, I mean, she was taken down by Jin Yu Frey. That's not exactly a great look. She did get a knockdown. Fight goes to decision. Uh, the Nunez fight, I mean, it was an injury. It was just done so quickly that it's like... Can't really take anything away from that. And then her contender series fight, she did have four takedowns. I just think Sam Hughes can make this grimy, get up in her face, make it ugly, make it close enough that um, you know that it's a coin flip. And if it's a coin flip, I want the plus one fifty. Not too many thoughts further than that, but I think Sam Sam Hughes is just like kind of historically underrated, and she's always an underdog in every single fight. You know that she's going to come. She's going to give you 100% effort as she goes out there every single fight. Give me the dog at plus 150. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to agree. Due to COVID, never really been all that impressed. Go back to that contender series fights, four takedowns, only 19 significant strikes landed. So not a great decision victory, but Dana says, I see something in this girl, so I, I'm going to give her the contract. Debut against Estela Nunez, that takedown that breaks Estela Nunez's arm, it was just like an awful shot from the outside that just happened to have the girl land awkwardly. But it almost seemingly is like her wrestling is not that good. She's just will she's ready to get exposed. 
it just whatever she's getting by on it and then the Jin Yu Frey fight the Jin Yu Frey fight she went 0 for 3 on takedowns and it got taken down by Jin Yu Frey more concerning than that is that she missed weight in the Jin Yu Frey fight so um Jin meanwhile used to fight at 105 back in the day so there should be some huge size advantage but there wasn't she came in against Jin Yu Frey at 116.6 so she's 0.6 over that's a bad weight cut she didn't blow weight by three pounds sorry i stopped she tried to make it just unfortunately wasn't able to should have been the bigger fighter and yet can't get takedowns and got taken down not a very good assault uh, not a very good performance at all does eventually get the win but one has to wonder she's got very low volume her wrestling's a little bit overrated and miss weight in that last fight against jinyu frey right then she got booked five months after that against Melissa Gatto, but she pulled out with medical issues. Medical issues due to what? Due to another bad weight cut? Due to the fact that your body's not responding to these hard training? Now you're going to tell me she's a two-to-one favorite coming in. She just coming off a canceled fight due to medical issues. She missed weight in the fight prior to that. She's not looked good, in my opinion, in any of her fights so far with the organization. And she's a two-to-one favorite? I just can't get behind it. Sam Hughes, meanwhile, the game plan for beating her is there. Is take her down. And I think that's why the line is where it's at. Dudakova is probably going to be pursuing takedowns. Sam Hughes has had trouble in the past with takedown defense. So why not? The difference is Sam Hughes has fought in a lot, lot better of level of competition than Dudakova. She's been taken down by better girls than Dudakova. And again, she's a dog. She's constantly in your face. Not only do you got to take her down, you got to hold her down. She gets back up. She's going to be landing the better strikes. She's going to be pushing forward. I think she's going to be mixing it up. She's always going to fight to the last minute. And even though, yeah, like you said, Uruguay, you know, had her number and is the more physical girl, she had, almost had to land 100 significant strikes just to out-volume a girl like Sam Hughes that's constantly mm -hmm. in your face. Dudakova won't do that. She'll slowly start falling behind the punch stats, behind the punch stats. Desperation takedowns. Oh, they don't happen? They don't materialize? Now you're getting backed up again. Now you're tired because you're shooting off your back foot. And those are the type of fights that Sam Hughes works her way back into and wins. So... I'll go Sam Hughes as well. Eight and six in, you know, pro record. It's not exactly the sexiest looking, but it doesn't matter. It's the stylistical clash, and this is one that I think does favor her. Again, if you're looking for live betting options, maybe a good live bet after the first round. That's generally where she starts to turn it on and have her most success. But all the same, I do think it's a valiant underdog play, and I'll be backing you on that one. All right, we got Jai Herbert taking on Rolando Bedoya. Minus 155 for Jai Herbert, plus 135 for Bedoya. I think this fight, I'm going to be taking another underdog here in Rolando Bedoya. I understand he's probably giving up some size in terms of like the reach and everything like that. But what really comes down to for me in this fight, unless there's a, you know, a massive, you know, grappling advantage for maybe Jai Herbert, but it's always tough kind of being like the, he's not that, he's only two inches taller than him, two inch reach advantage. I think it really comes down to volume. It's like Bedoya, we've seen. I mean, he's lost both of his both of his fights in the octagon so far. Uh, he did get knocked down by Son Kanan, so that is a bit of a red flag. But when the went to decision, and frankly, a lot of people thought he should have beaten Chaos Williams, and that Chaos Williams is a guy with power. So like Pretty that knockdown, anyway. that knockdown against Son Kanan looks a little bit weird and fishy. It is what it is. But what I really kind of am drawn to is 112 significant strikes against Song Kanan, 149 significant strikes against Bedoya. I mean, based on how Jai Herber fights historically, it's like he's going to get tripled up at this rate. Now, I know if Bedoya brings this type of fight, an all action, I'm willing to get hit to unleash on you. Obviously, you know, Jai Herbert's going to get more than, you know, 49 significant strikes is the most that he's registered inside of the octagon over the course of all of his fights here. Um, and lots of guys are usually trying to take him down, so on and so forth. I expect the both of these guys to exchange. I just don't know if if Jai can keep that pace with uh, with Bedoya. So um, it's a volume a volume game, and if he doesn't get his head knocked off, I just think he's just going to be throwing so much more heat. And my last little thing about it is if Jai Herbert, I mean, we were in England last week, Cody. If Jai Herbert, I mean, this is like me thinking like, you know, you like he's to Patty, do this sometimes. He's Patty Pimlet's buddy too, so you're not wrong. Why if wasn't he if they card? really <laughs> valued him as an English fighter, he would have been fighting last week. He wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been shipping him down to Abu Dhabi. So 
that's kind of where my head's at on this one. I had already that was the bet I made before we actually got on the airwaves here. Now I've got um, Ferguson, Bedoya, Sam Hughes are the three bets that I've made on UFC uh, Abu Dhabi so far. Yeah, honestly, it looks like a greasy underdog card where a bunch of dogs are going to be barking. And this is another one that looks good. I can't lie. When you look at when you look at Bedoya, it doesn't seem like he's the most technical guy, but he's one of these extremely strong Peruvian guys with a deep gas tank and ability to take a hell of a shot, and he just keeps ticking. The biggest difference here is that in his fight with Chaos Williams, he lands 149, and his fight with Song Kanan, 112. That puts his average at 8.7 strikes landed per minute. When you look at Jai Herbert, he'd be rocking a 2.69, yep, meaning his opponent close. lands on average about six strikes per minute more. And let me tell you, that's going to add up. Jai Herbert's got way better striking. Like, technically, he's a much more polished, refined guy. He was having good uh, success against Ilya Tapuria, you know, landing some hella good shots on him before eventually getting crumbled. But that's kind of what happens to him. He's two and four in the UFC, and three of those four losses are by knockout. When this guy gets hit, he gets hurt. He's now starting to rely on using his grappling a little bit more because he knows that range. He's a sitting duck. He's got all the skill in the world, beautiful high kick. He's a very long fighter, long range, beautiful straight right hand, polished, refined guy. Remember uh, Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts? Like, excellent striker. And then as soon as you put a little bit of pressure back on him, he'd melt. Melted, Herbert's yeah. kind of the same way. Herbert's now relying on that grappling to try to neutralize some of these spots and just slow down the clock so that there's less minutes of having to exchange at range. The draw with Ludovic Klein, he should have won that fight. A low blow lost him a point. The point led to the draw, but otherwise not terrible. But his fight with Faraz Zayam, he couldn't take him down and he got outworked from him. A, a young French Muay Thai fighter, if you're not going to take him down and you ain't going to keep pace with him, then you're going to lose, which is what he did. Against Rolando Bedoya, yeah, you're more refined. You got better striking, but I just don't think he takes him down consistently. He doesn't knock him out in the first round or submit him in the first round. Then he's going to have a Bedoya that's constantly coming forward, constantly looking to exchange shots. Bedoya arguably did get robbed against Chaos Williams. Bedoya landed 30 strikes more than Song Kanan, but it was that bigger shot. So again, he's a bit of a liability to either walk into something or just not do enough to impress the judges. But Dan, the boy is constantly working and coming forward. His average fight is a hundred plus significant strikes landed. Whereas I, I can't honestly see Jai Herbert coming over the 70 mark. So again, he might land some better shots and maybe mix in a little bit of ground control here and there. But overall, I hope that the judges are looking for who's trying to land the more damaging blows and who's coming forward and who's trying to fight which should be Bedoya. So it's a closer to a 50-50 fight, but because you're getting plus money on Bedoya, that's my pick too. All right. And finally, we've got uh, Cedric Dumas taking on Dennis Chalulin. Dumas is a minus 220 favorite. Chalulin can be had for plus 180. Who you got here, buddy? Yeah, honestly, probably plus one eighty. Dennis Tulin, and oh I know it, none of these are none of these are sexy picks. No, but the plus money makes sense for a lot of them, and they do have paths to victory. Cedric Dumas is very much that. He's a Dumas. You do not want to bet this guy at minus one eighty against anybody on the roster. The fact that he could be two to one against anybody is concerning. And there's a whole line long uh, list of this. His fight with Josh Frem, right? He walks into that second round guillotine choke after getting taken down by Frem. Frem hasn't looked like a particularly great grappler at this point in his UFC career but yet he makes Dumas look largely out of place. The fight with Cody Brunridge, he wins a unanimous decision, outstruck Brunridge 17-3. to It's super, super low volume. Dumas is long, he's rangy, but he doesn't throw much. His power is supposed to be there, but you're not even knocking out Cody Brunridge. That's concerning. Okay, fair enough. Abu Azetar, this one's massively concerning. Abu Azetar had struck him 41-34 to and took him down twice. Azetar had fought like once in the previous... Oh, I thought he fought Barrio, maybe. Yeah, anyways, he's probably had two fights in the last five years. He's much older, does not compete regularly. He has no pace, no output. And even he's working Dumas over. Outstruck him and took him down. But he gets a decision victory out of that. I don't like what he brings to the table. I think his wrestling game is weak. I think his grappling game is weak. He's supposed to be a long-rangey striker, but he doesn't have much pop on his shots. And he's not throwing very much volume. He's landing very much in the 17, 20, 34 range and that's just not going to get it done his last time out against uh ruzaboa if you could say early stoppage or not but that's what happens when he faces an actual superior striker he gets put on his ass dennis chulin's not the sexy pick because he's one and four in the ufc and that's fair but those losses 
Aliskabob Kurziev took him down twice. I'm not going to fault him there. Jung Young Park is a fringe top 15 guy. Gregory Rodriguez is a beast when he wants to be. Christian Leroy Duncan, meh. But at least he's got good footwork and he's able to fight moving backwards and had some better output that day. When I see how Tulin matches up with Dumas, Tulin very much is just a striker. He's tried training in Las Vegas. He tried getting two camps. It didn't do much of a difference. Now he's back in Russia training under Renat Fakhradinov. I'm sure they're working on his grappling. Bottom line is he is who he is. He's going to march forward and he's going to try to strike with you. His volume is better than Dumas's. His power is better than Dumas's. The thing is, is that he doesn't grab great takedown defense. Now, maybe Dumas goes out there with the game plan of taking him down, but I just don't think his grappling is very good. And beyond it not being very good, this is something Dennis is going to be working on with Renat Fakhradinov. You know, better guys can take him down. Sure, it's a work in progress. If there was another big takeaway that I had from that um, UFC card we're coming off of in the UK, a lot of these European wrestlers, European grapplers, like there's a knock on them. Like, they're man, they're all getting better. Takedown defense seems to be like the number one most rapidly developing skill in mixed martial arts. Guys that couldn't wrestle two years ago are all of a sudden stuffing takedowns off all American wrestlers. Mm -hmm. It's like that's the big transition. So for Dumas, who isn't a good wrestler to begin with, if his path to victory, if he's a two to one favorite on the basis of he's going to take Dennis Tulin down, yeah, I wouldn't guarantee it. And if he doesn't take him down, he's forced to stand with him. Dennis is going to work him. Dennis has got more power. He's got more volume. So, again, if, if Dennis was the favorite, you wouldn't be touching this with a 10-foot pole. But the, it's just not lined properly. And for that reason, I got to go with the Russian, Dennis Tulin, to get the job done. Yeah, I don't disagree, to be perfectly honest. There's no way I would bet du Dumas, or Dumas, as I like to call him, at minus, two th or minus 220. That would never be me. Um, just... Yeah, what's he? What's his like main skill? To be perfectly honest, like it's really good. tough to know. And like this may be like going way out of the bag, but it's like I think he enjoys his, you know, he enjoys his marijuana. It's the reason why Nick Diaz was supposed to be on this card, Cody, and uh, then he was just like, "Oh God, it's it's over in Abu Dhabi, and they'll put me in prison for <laughs> smoking a joint." Like, I'm just saying that like uh, maybe it, it could end up being a good thing for him too. You never really know. Some people are like functional, um, you know, pot smokers. Some people, you know, it makes them kind of, um, you know, lo like lost, lethargic. And they're like, they need it to get through their day. Um, but yeah, I mean, Dumas could be, you know, it could be missing, you know, what, what, what his regular uh, routine is while he's over there, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is his volume isn't great. I mean, he goes tit for tat, you know, exchanging wrestling exchanges with Abu Azatar, who's mostly just like a stand-up banger um, in his own right. Got take, like, He got the decision, but 17 significant strikes against Cody Brundage and was taken down and controlled for... Uh, sorry, he was taken down, but then he got reversals, and that's how he wins that fight against Cody Brundage. It was a bad fight, man. A bad fight. So if someone just stands in the pocket and says, okay, let's go, um, the, 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 the knockout power hasn't really shown its head too much, and that's where like Dennis has been getting himself in trouble in his most recent fights. So yeah, no, at this price, low-level low level middleweights, it's a dog or pass situation, 100%. I'm with you. I will be adding Tallulah into my ticket. I mean, this week, it's I'm I'm literally taking the just dog shots, man. Just dog shots on the money line. Ferguson, Bedoya, Sam Hughes, Tallulah. And uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see if anything else really jumps out. I don't think I'm going to get to Dante Mays because I'll feel like an idiot when he loses. I'm going to look more into the Vucenic. Versus Kutataladze fight. Um, I liked what you were saying there, but we'll see where like the numbers go with some of these other things uh, over the course of the week. Uh, hit him with the PRP, kid. Yeah, we're going to go with Umar Chito Vera is dog number one. God, Tony Ferguson dog number two. Uh, Lupi Godina is dog number three. Joel Alvarez, uh, Azmat Mirzakanov. Kawai Fernandez, Shamil Gaziev, Sam Hughes, dog number four, Rolando Bedoya, dog number five, Dennis Tulin, dog number six, Jordan Vukinich is dog number seven, and Shara Magomedov. So it's the 13 fight card, and 
seven underdogs at least I think are going to come through. And then there's going to be a couple ones that I didn't see coming or whatever the case has been happening the last couple of weeks. Uh, the main thing is, is this is a greasy card. If you want to attack it from a parlay standpoint, it might be another rough one. If you want to attack it like Paul is, singular bets on these plus monies, there's a couple of decent props as well. Probably less is more. And I'd love to be like, man, just parlay the ones that you do like from this card with some of that PFL. But PFLs, it's women and heavyweights. Ooh, it's a bad card, dude. So uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't, my man Paul Shaughnessy. But all the same, what can we do about it except for buckle down and hope for the best? So that's what we're going to do. And hopefully uh, the MMA gods shine a little bit of light on us. Yeah, I was looking at that PFL card briefly. It's it's real dicey, man. It's greasy. Now, I've been watching this whole season, so it's not like I'm like looking at this thing completely blind. But there's a lot of... It's like ditch of a... It's the, it's the most friendly price that we've got. With Dicheva, um, obviously all season by a mile, but do we really know what happens yeah, if the tough, fight goes to the mat fight. against somebody uh, of Jenna Bishop's caliber? Uh, yeah. Santos versus Carmouche is like, I like they Santos. They both look bad her, their last time out. Like, yeah. I like Santos in that last fight. Yeah, she's going to cruise here, and then she almost didn't. And then yeah. Carmouche looked awful the whole time, and then she won. Yeah, Carmouche so, like, was looking real bad. All of these heavyweights are greasy. The guys that are locks, like Alexei Pergande, is an absolute lock. He's a minus fourteen hundred favorite. So, uh, yeah, man. Honestly, it's another one that I'm gonna do some more tape study for and try to just again use the best pieces of this. There's UFC, there's a PFL, there's a BKFC, a Fury FC, an LFA, and a one championship. So I know that there's just you know a couple good spots on every card is gonna be a lot smarter than try to forcing some of these picks some of these greasy cards but Anthony again Ivey's it's like there's back. no there's no relief these days and anthony ivy's not good but he's on like a six he opened as i saw him open as the as the favorite and i considered betting jaleel, jaleel willis. willis but then i looked yeah. at jaleel willis and what he's been up to i'm like i don't feel that great about it. now jaleel willis is I the know. minus 160 favorite and ivy's plus 130 yeah, I know. So I know. it leads me to believe it's like that fight's probably 60 40 in one or two directions. Um, yeah, it's a tricky card. Tricky, tr tricky. All no one's giving money away, unfortunately, no. Cody. No, if anybody exactly. out there knows of somebody who's just giving money away, <laughs> hit us up at Paul Shag on Twitter, at CJ Safdick on Twitter. But that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Jared and Cody Saftik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh, oh, oh. Oh.